and welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to discuss the artificial intelligence revolution. AI is rapidly increasing its presence in almost every area of our lives, and we'll look at how it's likely to affect the entire world in the next few years. My guest is Steve Omohundro, chief scientist at AI Brain, which is a leading AI company. In his 35 years of AI research, Steve has been involved with numerous tech startups and research labs. He's also a former computer science professor at the University of Illinois, where he co-founded the Center for Complex Systems Research and designed two programming languages. He has a PhD in physics from UC Berkeley, and his goal is to make sure that AI is only used to benefit humanity. Steve, great to have you on the program today. So happy to be here. Steve, one thing that's involved with AI is something called neural nets. Could you give kind of a simplified example, conceptual, just to explain what a neural net is? Sure, let me give a little context. Um, the field of artificial intelligence was created in the late 1950s as computers were becoming more powerful. People realized, oh my goodness, we might be able to program these computers to behave like human brains, to show some intelligence. And there were sort of two approaches that people were exploring. One was sort of viewing intelligence as kind of like mathematical proof, very logical, very precise. They sometimes called those the neats. On the other side were people who felt like that's not how brains work. Brains are made of these cells called neurons that grow in complicated ways. And humans just experience the world. You start out as a baby not knowing anything. And then as you sort of interact with the world, you learn about it. And so they called, sometimes they called those people the scruffies. So the neats and the scruffies were battling for how intelligence works. And one of the very first systems was something called the perceptron, a guy named Frank Rosenblatt, which was an artificial neuron. It was a circuit that behaved in some ways like a neuron. It had weights that combined activities from other neurons and produced an output. And the key to it was that those weights could be adjusted to learn to perform some particular task. And that early neuron has been the thing that has really led to what's the excitement that's happening right now. So it's sort of a feedback loop. It gathers data, makes decisions, gets feedback on the results of those decisions, and then makes more finely tuned decisions the next time? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, many of them are used in something called supervised learning, where there's a task like, say, distinguishing dogs from cats. You show it a picture. You give it a bunch of pictures of dogs, and it has a dog output, and you adjust the weight so that those pictures trigger the dog output. You show it a bunch of pictures of cats, you adjust the weight so that the output shows the cat output, and then you show it something new, and it has to figure out, is that a dog or a cat? And starting around 2012, those networks started re working remarkably well, and that has led to a, just a huge revolution in the last 10 years. Now, what are some of the most important uses of AI right now? How are we seeing it show up in our lives? Well, there's a lot of AI research that does very exciting and unique things for, I mean, some of which don't yet have a lot of uses. One, one that's a little bit, got a lot of people worried is called deep fakes, where you can take somebody's face, say your face, take a picture of their face, and insert that into a video of somebody else saying something and make it so that it looks like the person whose face you, the picture you have is the one who's saying it. And so that is now widely available. People put it on YouTube all the time. Um, what does it do when you can make a video of anyone saying anything you want? And so that's an example of something which has a potentially big societal implication, and yet um, it's sort of, you know, that's a sort of a fun application. Where, where it's been really having a big impact are through something called recommender engines, which is every time you do a search on Google, it has to order the things that it shows you. Anytime you're on Facebook, it has to figure out which news stories you might be most interested in. And it's fairly simple AI that underlies those choices. And those choices are affecting the things that you see, your perception of the world, and drive a lot of economic activity through ads. Well, what kind of economic act? I understand it's very good for business in general because you can calculate the likelihood of selling products, the likelihood that you'll be able to build a product, your supply chain. A lot of very complex things in business could be automated maybe with AI and be a lot more efficient. Yeah, I mean, there's been a huge transformation in business over the past 20 years uh, from what sometimes people call linear companies, companies that make something and then sell it, to what's very popular today are what are called platform companies, which are 
uh, those companies serve to connect people that produce things with people that consume them. And all of the, the seven of the ten biggest companies in the world today are these platforms. So Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft. And they absolutely need AI to perform that function because they have to figure out for a particular product, you know, who, who is the customer that's most likely to need that, that product? And for that customer, what product are they looking for? So Amazon is a perfect example of uh, sort of a matchmaking between uh, the, the products that they sell and the customers that they have. And so that AI is really driving a lot of the economic activity. So it's really getting very well integrated into our whole economic system. Elon Musk had a quote recently. He said, AI is not the icing on the cake, not just an incremental change on top, but it, it is the whole cake. Like everything depends on it. Absolutely. I think much of this economic infrastructure is being transformed right now as we speak. It won't be long before a lot of the social infrastructure is transformed and also the military infrastructure. And so pretty much every aspect of our society is going to uh, rely on AI in a fundamental way. And part of the challenge there is to make sure that the the, what life is like is not damaged in that process, so that we retain the human aspect of, of, of what we enjoy about, about our society while making everything much more efficient using AI. Now, is anybody working on making sure it stays benign? Because the people who use AI are not necessarily the same ones who create it, and it looks like there's a lot of competition. It's like the nuclear arms race, the AI race, whatever country dominates AI, dominates the whole world, and that's where we seem to be headed. Yeah, very much so. Every country realizes that this is a very important technology. Vladimir Putin came out and said the country that you know, leads in AI will dominate the world. China has a, a, you know, a plan for them to become the preeminent AI uh, country, and the U.S., of course, wants to be preeminent. And so there really is a kind of battle. Interestingly, so far, um, the companies that are involved in it and the research labs tend to be very, very open. They tend to publish most of their work. They tend to even give away the source code for some of their best systems. And so whether that continues as uh, the competition heats up will be very interesting to see. So how does it affect our daily life right now? Has it reached us where, like, you know, in the course of your day, AI is having a big effect on you? You know, I think mostly when you use the internet, that there's typically some simple AI behind the scenes. Every time you do a Google search, you've got some AI going. You've got, um, there are now translation apps. And so uh, if you run into a web page that's in another language, you know, that app can translate it to English. You can read it. It's something that you don't even think much about, and yet there's AI running in the background. Now, when we talk about artificial intelligence, is it really intelligence or is it a simulation? Uh, does human intelligence, uh, is it somehow qualitatively different from machine intelligence? Does human intelligence have something that machines don't have? Or is human intelligence ultimately reducible to a bunch of ones and zeros? That's a core question. And I think one of the most fascinating philosophical aspects of artificial intelligence is that it will help us answer that kind of question. Uh, one of the very early uh, visionaries about AI was uh, someone named Alan Turing. And he proposed a Turing test, which is, you know, you know you have an intelligent system if somebody can't tell the difference between a real human and that, and that system by, by communicating with them. And we're not quite there yet. The, today's systems are getting pretty good at chatting back and forth, but they have a slightly odd quality to them. And so we're not quite, quite at the point where it feels like you're really talking to a human. There's the Alexa app that Amazon has that um, is very good at retrieving information, but uh, that app doesn't yet sort of uh, convince you that it's a person. Now, there are many types of intelligence. One kind of intelligence is emotional intelligence. Can we have artificial intelligence that is smart about emotions, recognize emotions that people are feeling, or take emotions into account when making decisions? Yeah, that's a, another you know, key question. Since we tend to view our emotional lives as very human in nature, Many labs are working on AI systems to detect emotions, so they can look at your face and sort of figure out, oh, you're angry, oh, you're happy. Even the tone of voice, even there are now apps that can sort of uh, read your heartbeat uh, from a video and figure out, oh, if you're feeling stressed at a certain moment. 
And so detecting emotions is one thing. Generating emotions is somewhat cha more challenging. There's some experimental systems where they're voice systems and they can express a little bit with a little bit of emotion. They're still a little awkward, but I think we should expect over the next few years to have systems that are emotionally intelligent in that way. And then the key question will be, are they really feeling the emotions or are they just simulating those emotions? And I think there's gonna be a lot of discussions well, about that. Well, there's a question about whether machines can actually be conscious and people are still discussing this. And if you say that, you know, machine is really alive, then does it have legal rights? Is uh, dismantling it like killing somebody? Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Should we maintain a clear distinction between man and machine or say, well, the line is actually a little bit blurry. Maybe we can't always be sure which side of the line you're on. I think that's something we're gonna have to decide as we kind of move into this new era. We're starting to see the very bare beginnings of it. Uh, the the uh, Saudi Arabia uh, admitted a robot as their first robot citizen. I think more as a PR move, but still it was a stimulating and interesting question. You know, these systems are very likely to start performing functions in our society. They're very likely to be able to buy and sell things economically, and so they will be economic agents. Do we want them to be full citizens? Do we want them to vote? One of the challenges there is that um, you can replicate these systems. So if you have an AI that you're really happy with, that you like, well, you can just take its code and copy it. So if AIs are allowed to vote, well, then maybe I'll make a million copies of my AI and have it vote for the candidate that I think is best. Or maybe they'll make smarter decisions. Could they look at candidates and say, this person would be a better, uh, or is he still limited by what's programmed into it? Well, these systems typically, the ones that are, are sort of coming around today, they typically learn. So they build up knowledge through experience. And uh, they're not very good at reasoning yet, but they will be very soon. And so one of the functions I think is very important, I think each person, each citizen, should have their own personal AI that knows their values, knows what they care about, and serves as kind of a buffer from the rest of the world so that, for instance, let's say you know you're vulnerable to seeing a certain kind of advertisement. You don't really wanna buy a car right now, but if you see a car ad, you might wanna go buy it. You could have your personal AI filter car ads so that you don't see them. Do you think that as we become more dependent on AI to make our decisions for us, we'll get less intelligent even as the AI gets more intelligent? Well, it's a really interesting question. We kind of offload certain questions to the AI. You know, when I was young, calculators were coming and many of my friends offloaded their multiplication ability to their calculator. Um, these days, you know, if you want to drive somewhere, typically you use Google Maps, uh, and so maybe you for, you don't know how to how to navigate without uh, without the cell phone, and so I think already we're putting certain functions into these devices, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, that frees up more space and time to do things that maybe you care more about. Now, how can we make sure that machines remain our servants and don't become our masters? Yeah, very critical question, um, and defining even what that is. Like already today, many people spend a lot of time on their cell phones. Are we the master of those phones or are we, you know, sort of, uh, you know, getting clicks on our Instagrams as a, as a sort of a slave to that? Or if machines can do perform most tasks better than humans, then why are humans more important than machines? What if humans are more expendable than machines because machines can do more? I think we need to adopt a philosophy that humans are intrinsically valuable and important, totally independent of what we might do. I mean, I think most people have that view that uh, let, let's say, you know, a young baby can't do much in the world and yet they're very precious and we care enormously about them. And so just because AIs are performing certain tasks better than us, I don't think that devalues the importance and necessity of humans. Now, if they can do most types of work better than humans, well, most humans still have jobs. People who drive trucks for a living could be replaced. People in a lot of occupations could be replaced. I think longer term, they're gonna increase the economic productivity so hugely that it won't be necessary for everyone to work in the way that we think of today. The challenge will be people will need to find things that are meaningful to them that they will use their time for. And I think that could lead to a very a flourishing and wonderful society. Well, the search for meaning is sort of a constant in human life. People are always searching for meaning and purpose. Does AI add any value to that search? Does AI help us 
find meaning or purpose? Is the purpose of AI just to make our life as easy and effortless as possible, or does it free us up for perhaps you know nobler pursuits and question in the you know, already uh, Alexa, the, the Amazon app, uh, has access to many of the entries in Wikipedia. And so you can ask Alexa questions and she can find stuff. And so I'm just imagining what it would be like to be a young child who has an Alexa app. That child, anything they're curious about, they could ask Alexa and discover all of the world's knowledge about that topic. And so it's an amazing portal, an entryway into the whole of human knowledge, including philosophical, spiritual, religious ideas. And so that child can use the AI as a tool to gain their own, to gain a richer perspective in those issues. At some point they have to own it themselves, though they have to make their own decisions. What's important to them? What's worth doing? What's worth pursuing? Is that, is that something that a machine can tell them what to do, like a machine should choose your career for you? Or are there some things you just have to own that? That's a fantastic question. Today's AIs are not to the level where any person should offload their life purpose to this machine. But you know, in probably the next decade, I would say, you can have an AI, for instance, that say knows you know, stoic philosophy. You may decide, oh yeah, I want to be a really good stoic. Uh, let me get this AI app that helps me be a better stoic. Um, at AI Brain, we're working on uh, many apps that we call augmented intelligence, things that help people be more like themselves, be more effective at, at what they want to do. And in fact, we have an app that uh, helps people deal with their emotion regulation. And so there's a psychologist that's involved in building that. And the app, um, you know, let's say you're feeling stressed and angry, um, the app hopefully will help you uh, manage that emotion so that you're more effective in your life. So does the app know that you're stressed and angry? Or do you say, I'm feeling stressed and angry now, what should I do about it, app? Mm. In the current version, it's more providing um, information to you. Uh, later versions should detect that and immediately show you things that, you know, maybe play you some music that will help calm you down if that's mm -hmm. it. Or something like but that. we're talking about AI as a psychological tool. You know, people go to psychiatrists, they spend a ton of money, go like uh, maybe twice a week for 10 years. You know, sometimes you don't see much progress. So maybe a, an app wouldn't be much worse than that. Yeah, absolutely. Even today's very limited AIs, I think, can help a lot. There's certain styles of therapy, something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which are very formulaic in a way, sort of reframing issues. So instead of saying, you know, oh, everybody hates me, you say, oh, maybe one or two people don't like me, but, you know, other people like me, something like that. Can, and AIs today could easily handle that kind of can thing. Can AI predict human behavior? So, for example, if someone commits a crime, can AI be used to analyze their life and predict whether they're likely to be a repeat offender? Yeah. What are, what are the implications of that? Huge, huge issues. China, in particular, has been exploring that uh, area. They have something called uh, the social credit score, which, just like in the U.S., we have your financial credit score. Uh, they have something which measures how good of a citizen you are. And if you do enough bad things or you say enough bad things about uh, the Chinese government, your, your credit score goes down, and that limits things you can do in that society. And so uh, from the West, we tend to look at that and, and feel like that's very dystopian. But there are elements of it which, uh, you know, uh, I think are going to come here as well. Well, people are very imperfect. Now, if you have a system which is good at detecting faults, uh, that could be very problematic because people will go to great lengths perhaps to cover up their faults. Is there something dangerous about saying uh, this app is going to determine everything wrong with you and put it in the big database so anybody can check it out at any time? Yeah, that's the dystopian view, kind of uh, big brother sort of view. Um, there's sort of the flip side of that. There was a wonderful book called The Transparent Society which sort of has a compliment to Big Brother, which is Little Sister, uh, which looks up at the, the bigger society, the government, the pol politicians, and empowers the individual in that setting. And so how that balance goes, I think, is going to be really fundamental to the kind of society we want to create. I think AI can be used for either of those functions. So do we basically decide what we think about people? Like, is there a prevailing philosophy in society about people like, we assume that people are basically good and decent until proven otherwise, or we assume that people are basically untrustworthy and have to be watched all the time. That's a decision that we have to make, and then we program our machines accordingly. 
Yeah, one of the fascinating things about AI is that it's very neutral to that kind of decision. That you can build an AI that implements whatever philosophical uh, framing that you, you would like to have. You can make it implement a social system which is very rigid and uh, you know is focused especially on eliminating crime. Or you can make it so that it enhances freedom and it's all about helping people interact in better ways. It's a choice that every society is going to have to make. And uh, it's coming quite soon, I think. Well, there are certain uh, traits in human history, like the desire to dominate, the desire to rule. That doesn't go away easily, not even for the collective well-being of humanity as a whole. Is it possible that given the kind of drives that people have, AI will end up causing more harm than good? It's a risk. Um, one of the areas where people are doing a lot of thinking about that is in use of AI in the military. Uh, military has very challenging log logistic issues. They have to plan in very adverse circumstances. They've got a lot of equipment. They have to make sure everything's working. AI is a perfect tool to help with that. And so every military on the planet is incorporating AI. One of the areas where there's controversy is something called uh, LAWS, L-A-W-S, which is Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems, which is you might have a tank which is driven by an AI, and can that tank decide to you know, blow up a building or shoot somebody on its own accord, or should there always be a human in the loop? And there are various groups around the world right now that are, are um, lobbying to ensure that people stay in the middle of those decisions. Well, there are a lot of decisions that have to be made on the battlefield. For example, is it preferable to kill everybody on the other side, or is it preferable to just push them back on the other side of the border, uh, but let them continue? And that sounds like a human decision. And with demographics, uh, right now there are millions of people, refugees driven from their homes. There's no place to go. Uh, should we try to rescue them all, or should we write them off? I mean. We can develop AI to implement either decision, but we can't assign to AI the responsibility for making that decision. That's, we can't pass that decision along. We have to decide how much we value human life. Yes, I agree. And um, I'm very hopeful that AI will create such economic value that we'll be able to deal with a lot of the issues that are uh, a result of poverty today uh, in a very, in much better, mm -hmm. better mechanisms than we have today. Well, let's talk about some specific applications of AI, like for example, in the field of medicine. I understand AI can lead to great benefits there. What are some examples of how medical science can be advanced, whether in diagnostics or drug development or uh, preventive medicine? What, what do we have going on there? We're really in the middle of an explosion of new applications in that area. Um, early on, some of the first uh, AI systems were for diagnosis. You, know, you see a patient's uh, symptoms, and the uh, AI can know about every obscure disease. If you've ever watched the TV show House, uh, you could have an AI with all of that kind of knowledge. Didn't really make an impact uh, in actual medicine because doctors really were nervous about having this system that might usurp some of their power. These days, I think those kinds of diagnostic systems are uh, being used in more areas. They're being used for analyzing, say, radiology uh, images, looking for cancer. They're being used um, as robotic surgeons, very, very precise surgeries, such as brain surgery. There are now uh, robot arms that can do those quite well. Uh, I saw an amazing talk about uh, a, a robot that does hair transplant surgery. Apparently, hair transplant involves taking hair from one part of the head and moving it to another one. And it's very boring and time consuming, takes three or four hours, but it's perfect for robots. And so that was a, an example of a very useful thing. Drug design is something that's really hot right now. And uh, one of the great challenges in biology has been given the structure of a protein, how does it fold up? What does it look like? And, and you know, in order to design drugs to deal with certain, certain bad proteins, you need to know what they look like. And there's been a big advance recently using some of these deep learning technologies in order to do protein folding. And so it looks to me like over the next decade or so, that technology is going to get better and better. I expect to have AI systems which will be able to simulate the full functioning of cells uh, in the next few decades. So does that mean there's a potential to cure any kind of disease, like no matter what virus might happen to come along, we could instantly analyze it and figure out what drug could cure it. Uh, right now, drug testing is a very slow trial and error kind of process with AI. Maybe that could be speeded up. It could generate leads, 
uh, chemicals that have a high probability of succeeding, and then you focus on those. Yeah, and if you have a good simulation model, you can do the testing in the computer. You don't have to actually do it in real life until maybe the very end. And so you can, uh, you know, dramatically, potentially dramatically speed up development. And for something like this coronavirus that's going around right now, that would be, you know, a huge life lifesaver. So is this a great field to get into now if a young person is just getting out of grad school and they're trying to get, you know, there are a huge number of jobs with AI. Right Absolutely. Now. There's way more demand than there are people that are knowledgeable. There's, you know, at the level of actually building these AI systems, that's important. There's a whole field for data scientists, which are people that you mostly use the existing systems to analyze in particular application areas. Every business is going to have to start incorporating AI into that business. They need people who understand AI technologies and who understand that business. And so I think there's just huge, huge opportunity in that area. Does it take a lot of training to get into it? Like Elon Musk recently announced he was looking to hire people to work on AI. He said, no experience necessary. You don't even need a high school diploma. Mm. All you have to have is a basic ability to code and be willing to work hard, and they could train all the rest. You know, there are different levels. If you really want to invent new AI algorithms, that requires a lot of knowledge, a lot of mathematics, maybe a PhD. But if you just want to use existing algorithms, then in fact many of them have been bundled up into very simple to use things like uh, Elon Musk is saying. And so uh, I think there's a big opportunity for, um, you know, and a lot of high school students are making, you know, they're, they're taking an existing algorithm and they're using it in a unique and novel situation and getting wonderful results from that. So that's a very exciting, empowering tool. We're just about out of time. Last quick question. Would you say you're basically optimistic that all this AI is going to turn out very well for humanity rather than the reverse? Yeah, I'm an optimist. Um, I've written a number of papers about things that could go wrong. But there are a lot of people thinking about that now, and so I think with proper foresight, we can guide this in a way that's really good for humanity. And I think that's a good note on which to end. I'd like to thank you for being here today. Steve Omohundro, Chief Scientist at AI Brain. This is Marty Wasserman. For Future Talk, visit our website, www.futuretalk.net, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.